with everything that we see going on around us in this world, <clears throat> everything we watch on TV, everything we hear, everything we're around every day, it is clear that we are living in a very fallen world. And we've been fallen since the fall in the Garden of Eden. Satan used deception, and he deceived Eve. Adam followed after. And since that time, man has been separated from God until Jesus came. And he paid that price. He became the ultimate sacrifice. And he paid the price for our sins that we could not pay. And if we accept Jesus Christ and we have faith in what he did on the cross for us, we can be redeemed and our relationship to Christ can be restored. Why do I say the world is fallen? Well, in Matthew chapter 24, Jesus tells us about the things that are going to go on in the end time. He mentioned some of the things. And he said this would be near the, near the end or at the beginning of the end. Wars and rumors of wars, pestilence, disease, famines, all these things we see. So we know we're in the end time. We do not know when the Lord is coming back, but we do know that he's coming. And I hope that myself and all of you who claim to be Christians, who claim to be children of God are ready as well. Would you please turn with me to the book of 1 Corinthians? I'm going to read verse 16, excuse me, chapter 16, verse 13. It says, watch ye, stand fast in the faith, quit you like men and be strong. In this fallen world, with everything going on around us, God has told us to watch and to stand. This morning, through the help of the Holy Spirit, I want to encourage you to stand firm in your faith in the Lord. Watch ye. That's a military term. It insinuates that a lot of believers are asleep, that we're not awake, that we're walking around in a fog. We've become comfortable in our salvation. We're sitting and we're resting in it. We don't deny the Lord outright with our words, but in our actions sometimes we do. The Word of God tells us to be vigilant. You know we have an enemy an adversary, and it is his goal each and every day to take us out. I was uh, listening to something the other day that it was disturbing. This, this man, well, he was giving a testimony about how he used to be a follower of Satan. And he prayed all night long to Satan. And we can't as believers sometimes pray for 10 or 15 minutes? When is the last time we spent an hour alone with the Lord? It's interesting that people who practice witchcraft and Satanism, they know the word of God and they study it because they know that what tools to use against God's people, right? And they pray in the spirit. Satan has power. He's not all powerful like God, but he has power. And if they pray to him and they sacrifice to him, he gives them things, you know, gifts and, 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 and things that they're able to do. And they operate in that, not realizing that it's going to end in death for them, not just spiritually or physically, but eternally. And if people in the world that are practicing satan satanic rituals and following Satan can spend all night long in prayer to the enemy, surely we as believers can spend time in prayer with the Lord. Work up to it, build up to it. It took me a while to get to where I was 
praying the length of time. And it's not about the length of time. For me, prayer is about just connecting with God. Yes, I go to the Lord. I pray throughout the day about things that I need from him or things that I need him to assist me with. Or I pray for my brother, my sister. I pray for our church. I pray for our leaders. I pray for our government. I pray for a lot of things. But there are times when you just need to get alone with the Lord, you and him, that secret place, not to ask for things, but to receive from him, just to receive from him. Watch ye stand fast in the faith. Quit you like men. That's telling us to grow up spiritually. Some of us have been saved for years, but you can't tell by the way we live our lives. We're still walking immaturely. We're still struggling with the same things that we struggled with years ago. Things that we have yet to surrender to the Lord. Because we love those things more than we love God. And be strong. Sounds simple. Once again, we fail in that because we don't surrender to God. It's not our strength. We're weak. It's only in his strength that we are strong. Amen. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 58, the word reads, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. The Lord expects us to be steadfast and unmovable, not back and forth. Not tossed about. What is the scripture? Let me find it. There's a scripture. I can't find it readily. But it speaks about us being tossed about like the wind. Every wind of doctrine that comes along, things that come along that throw us off. Because the enemy is using his people to bring us down, to take us from our position of standing. I want to be like David. David said in Psalm 62, 5 through 7, My soul, wait thou only upon God, for my expectation is from him. He only is my rock and my salvation. He is my defense and I shall not be moved. And God is my salvation and my glory. The rock of my strength and my refuge is in God. If we all had that heart and that mind to look to God for our strength, to know that he is our rock, that he is our salvation, that he is our refuge, that he alone is our strong tower. The word of God tells us to stand in the Lord. In Philippians chapter 4, verse 1, it says, Therefore, my brethren, dearly beloved and longed for, my joy and crown, so stand fast in the Lord, my dearly beloved. We must realize that if we're not standing in the Lord, we are not standing. We cannot stand unless we stand in the Lord, unless we abide in him and he abide in us. He is the vine, church. We are the branches. We need the Lord. We have to remain in him. We have to continue to stand in the Lord. There is no doubt that we will fall without standing in the Lord. God's word tells us to stand in grace. In Romans chapter 5, verse 1, through two, 1 and 2, it says, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. This is a beautiful text that Apostle Paul wrote, telling us that we're justified by faith. And it doesn't take years to, to receive that justification from the moment you accept Jesus and you believe and you evidence faith. 
and what he did on the cross for us, you're immediately justified and your relationship is immediately restored back to the Lord. And that's where that peace comes in. Not the peace of God, but peace with God. You see, since the fall of man, we have been at, in, in, at enmity with the Lord. We've been his enemy. We've been against him. Even in Christ, being a Christian, my flesh wars with God every single day. That's why Paul said, I deny myself daily and I take up my cross and I, I follow him. It's, it's a continual thing. It's not something you do one time. Because again, Satan is who he is and he's trying to take us from our position of standing, standing in our faith, standing in the Lord, standing in grace. By whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand. When we put our faith, when we stand in our faith, faith being cross and him crucified, that's what it is. That's what our faith stands on. That's what it should stand on. Outside of that, it's not faith. We have access by faith to his grace. Do you understand what that means? By standing in faith, living for the Lord, accepting his sacrifice, we receive his grace. Grace is unmerited favor. The word unmerited means we do not deserve it. But because he loves us, God loves the world so much, he sent his son to die for us. We don't love him just because we love him. We love him because he loved us first. And he gave his son as a sacrifice for us. It's an unspeakable gift And we have it if we stand firm in our faith. The grace of God is unmatched. I know I've, I've had opportunities to give people grace and I've done that. And other times I didn't want to do that because I didn't feel like they deserved it. But the Lord doesn't treat us that way. None of us are deserving of his love, his grace, his forgiveness, his mercy. Oh, but we, he gives it to us anyway, and I thank him for that. In Galatians 5 and 1, it says, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. We're supposed to stand in freedom. Standing in freedom. Faith also means standing in freedom. We sing a lot of songs about freedom. We know all the words. But why are we still bound? Why are we not standing in the freedom, walking in the freedom, in the deliverance that Jesus died for? As believers, we can stand in freedom today. We don't have to be bound by our sin, by our addictions, by our thoughts, by our shortcomings, all those things that the, world's def the world defines us by and says, if you're too tall or you're too short or you, you, you're too big or too small, you don't have this amount of money, you don't have this car, this house, this spouse, whatever it is the world measures us by, none of that matters. We are free in the Lord, free to live for him free to walk in his will for our life. And like Pastor Taylor spoke about, just humbling ourselves before the Lord and walking in that freedom, accepting it. I have so much peace in the Lord since I realized that I am free from Satan and he no longer has a hold on my life. And not to say that I don't go through things I'm human. I go through things like everyone else. I get sick. I have car trouble. I have issues at my job. I have issues in my marriage. I have issues with my children. I have I've had issues my entire life. But the longer 
I've been in my relationship with the Lord, I realize whatever's going on, I'm still free. If I die today, I'm free. And I'm going to spend my eternity with the Lord because I can, I'm going to continue to stand in my faith. I'm going to stand in grace. I'm going to stand in the Lord. I am going to stand in my freedom. In Philippians chapter 1, verse 27, it says, Only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ, that whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs, that ye stand fast in one spirit, with one mind striving together for the faith of the gospel. You know, I grew up in church, so I've seen a lot of things. And I'm very disheartened when I see division in the church. Or I see members of the church speaking negatively about the leadership or uh, hearing saints whisper and say negative things about our church family. We should be uplifting one another. We should be standing in unity with one another. The word of God says, how can two walk together except they agree? It also says that a house divided cannot stand. And Satan knows that, and that's why he brings division in the church. And as a believer, we should turn away from that. Whatever direction you need to go in, if it comes to you, shut it down. Pray for that person or those people, whoever they are. Because as believers, we are one in Christ. And if we're going to stand for the Lord and in the Lord and spread the gospel, be the gospel, <laughs> we're going to have to stand in unity together, praying for one another, uplifting one another, encouraging one another. We're the minority. Most of this world is on their way to hell. And as believers, we need to come together and stand strong in our faith in the Lord. Amen. By us standing, we could lead some of them to the Lord too. But if we don't stand, we're going to fall with them. In Colossians chapter 4, verse 12, it says, Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Christ, saluteth you, always laboring fervently for you in prayers, that ye may stand perfect and complete in all, in all the will of God. As believers, we're supposed to stand perfect and complete, it says. Does that mean sinless perfection? No, it does not. These terms perfect and complete mean spiritually mature and carrying through to the end. Carrying through to the end. What are we carrying through to the end? The will of God for our lives. So if we're standing in faith, we're standing in the faith, we should also be able to stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. We should be able to stand without wavering, acknowledging God's will for our life, laying our will aside. We always think we know better than the Lord for some reason. We have to learn the hard way sometimes. I've had to learn the hard way sometimes. But as we grow, and we mature in the Lord, we learn that his will is best and it's the safest place for us. So as we stand firm in our faith, we stand in the Lord, we stand in grace, we stand in freedom, we stand in unity and we stand perfect and complete. I know this isn't the first time you all have heard or read these scriptures. So why is it that we know to stand, but we don't? 
We're so easily deceived, distracted, discouraged. Why is that? I think the main reason is because we're not properly prepared to stand. We're not preparing ourselves. In Ephesians chapter 6, Paul lays out the whole armor of God. He instructs us to put on the whole armor of God that we may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. And then he goes on to speak about what we're wrestling against. It's not flesh and blood. It's principalities against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. As believers, sometimes I think we take, we don't, we know we've heard we're in a spiritual battle, but we don't really realize what we're up against. Spiritual wickedness. All of this, these things that are going on behind the scenes. And as I mentioned earlier, they're preparing themselves. They're fighting all the time. And this same gentleman that I'm speaking about said in his testimony that he laughed at Christians because he knew that most of the ones that he met were not living the life that they should be living. But he was being faithful to what Satan would have him to do. So he laughed at us. He thought it was comical. He would go in churches and taunt people on purpose. Are you carrying and wearing the full armor of God this morning? Because if you're not, you will not be able to stand against the enemy. The belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, the gospel of peace, the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, the sword of the spirit, and prayer in the spirit. Of all those things mentioned, they cover the body. The only offensive weapon that God gives us is his word. The word says it's quick and it's sharper than any two-edged sword. Why do you think the enemy and our flesh keeps us from the word of God so much? Because Satan knows the word and his people they study it too. They know it. They know it better than most Christians. And I think that's really sad. When the Lord left this earth, he left us with the Holy Spirit that lives in us, that teaches us, that guides us, that corrects us, comforts us. But we have his word. And as believers, we're not studying it. We're not reading it. We make it a chore to read God's word. And it is so important. It is vital. If you have every other piece on and you don't have the sword to fight the enemy. And when I read that, I think about certain situations that I've been in and I've studied something in the scripture and the Lord brings it to me. The enemy brings a thought and I can shut it down immediately with God's word. Or someone comes to me and they say something and in love, I can shut it down. I can fight that with God's word. A circumstance or a situation comes up and fear wants to grip my heart not with all the word that I have hidden in my heart. And I can speak that to the enemy. And immediate peace comes. So yes, we need all of it. We need the helmet of salvation. The Lord, we need all of it. But don't forget about the word and prayer. You see a lot of people talk about the, the whole armor of God, and because prayer is on that next verse, they don't mention that. 
but it's so vitally important for us to have an active prayer life. God's word says to pray without ceasing. Even in this scripture, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit. That's another thing that a lot of us lie down on. We've got to pray. If you don't have an active prayer life, start one today. It's part of our whole armor. And if we're not wearing the armor, we are not prepared to fight in this spiritual battle that we are in. Paul reminds us that we wrestle not against flesh and blood because we don't. The enemy wants us to be warring and fighting with one another so he can distract us from God's word and what it's telling us to do. So we're not fighting and warring against his kingdom. Sometimes we are unable to stand on God's word because we're walking in pride and we have a self-righteous spirit. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 12, it says, Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. Remember that pride goes before destruction and in haughty spirit before a fall. So don't ever think that you've arrived as a Christian. If you want to follow Christ, you have to deny yourself. You have to take up your cross daily. This is a daily thing. Don't ever think, oh, I've prayed, I've read the word, I've fasted, I've testified today, I witnessed to someone today, I went to church every day this month or every Sunday this month, so I've arrived. We will forever need the Lord and we can never become too confident in our abilities or we will fall. In closing, I want to go to Matthew chapter 7, and I'm going to read verse 13 and 14. It says, Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. This gate that they're speaking about, of course, is Jesus. And as I mentioned earlier, we're the minority. So most of the world is taking that wide, easy path straight to a place that was not prepared for them. We're studying the book of Revelation right now, and um, I think the last statistic I saw said there's about 8 billion people in the world. And if you do the math, I know one part of Revelation talks about a fourth of the people dying, so we're down to 6 billion. And then another chapter after that talks about a third of man dying, so now we're down to 4 billion. So we know that at least half the people in this world are going to be destroyed. They're going to be in that number outside of the few. I don't know about you, but I want to be one of the few. I want to be one of the few that walk in that straight gate, that walk that straight path, that narrow path. I want to be one of the ones who stand in my faith who continue to stand in the Lord, who trust him like David did. He is my refuge and he is my salvation. He alone is my rock. I will not waver and be tossed back and forth with all the different winds of doctrine that are being preached and taught. I will stand in grace and I will stand and walk in the freedom that my Savior died for. I will not allow his sacrifice to be in vain. I will be a living sacrifice unto him so that maybe 
my standing on in my faith in the Lord would help some of these people that would otherwise have died and went to hell. Some of these people on this wide path to destruction. We're the salt of the earth. The church, the people of God. We're the salt of the earth. And if we don't stand in our faith, we're going to fall. Others will fall around us because we haven't lived that life that we should live. There's a quote that says, those who stand for nothing fall for anything. Well, I say if we don't stand firm in our faith, we're going to be lost and we're going to fall like the rest of the world. That's not God's will for our life. He came that we might have life and that we might have life more abundantly. It is not his will for us to perish. But if we don't stand firm in our faith, we will fall. So I'm just encouraging you this morning to, to stand in your faith, knowing and believing that through God, through Jesus and his sacrifice, we can make it. Amen. If you just bow with me for a word of prayer. Lord, I just thank you for this moment, this opportunity, this message that you gave me to share. And I pray that everyone who hears it opens their heart to receive it. I pray that it fell on good ground this morning. I pray, Lord God, that it convicts where it needs to convict, Lord God. It corrects where it needs to correct, God. It encourages where it needs to so that we can stand firm in our faith, God, in you and you alone and your sacrifice that you made for us. Lord, we need you each and every day. And we know that we can't fight this battle on our own. So remind us, Lord, of your word and help us to put on the whole armor of God so that we can be covered from our head to our feet and we'll have the word to combat and fight the enemy. We'll have the shield of faith to, to block all the fiery darts of the enemy. We'll remain in prayer continually, Lord, so that you can strengthen us in every area of our life. Lord, we need you this morning. And we ask humbly, Father, that you would just help us to continue to stand in the faith. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Sister Angela. That was a great word. It is always good to be reminded to stand firm in our faith. We are called to stand, not to cower, and not to run. So thank you for that word. A um, couple quick announcements. We have a food pantry, as you guys know, and we are currently in need of some volunteers. So if you want to volunteer and serve in the food pantry ministry, please see Sister Boyd, who is not in, oh, who is right there with her hand up. So yes, please see Sister Boyd. And also, if you haven't given, we do need your support. So please go ahead and look at all the ways that we have to give. And we are currently live on our TV commercial campaign. And we are at $72,000 right now. So, um, yes, give as you are led to give. With that being said, let's rise for a quick word of prayer and I will dismiss us. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for your word. We thank you because that is truly all that we need. We thank you because your word has gone forth. And we thank you because it came from you, Lord. Father, we just give you all the praise and glory. We ask that you help us stand firm, Lord. Give us the grace that we need to run this race, Lord. Help us to not um, serve you, Lord, from a place of fear and from a place where we are tossed to and fro, Lord. But help us to serve you from a place of victory, Lord, because you 
you've already won. So, Father, we love you, we honor you, and we give you all the praise and all the glory. In the mighty, precious, holy name of your Son, we pray. Amen. You are dismissed. See you guys at the next service or Wednesday. <laughs>